Okay, so it's around 2.30. Uh, I think I'm gonna get, just get started on time. People might come in early, uh, late, but it's fine. Because uh, I'm starting with a really fluffy thing, which is uh, my title uh, image for this presentation is a painting by the Italian uh, Baroque master Caravaggio. I wanted to kind of instill some culture in this group of programmers. And uh, <laughs> it's Narcissus, who is uh, the figure from Greek mythology who stared in his own reflection for so long that he turned into a flower because uh, he was going to die. Uh, but this might be a more accurate painting um, from a more modern era. And this may look like some code bases you've worked in. Uh, if it does, I feel sorry for you. So if you're in, this, uh, in the audience for this talk, you probably have some idea already of what reflection is. Uh, but because terms are very overloaded in mathematics and computer science, uh, it's always good to define our terms. But another uh, philosophy I like to follow is when you're trying to design a solution to a problem, you should really start with the problem rather than coming up with you know, some mechanism you think is cool. and I mean, that's fun too, but if you're going to change a language, it should be motivated by a real use case. So this is one problem, uh, one example is, uh, this is very common. You have uh, some graphical library, you're trying to draw shapes. And you have some primitive shapes, boxes, circles, maybe you have some more primitives defined by a rendering library. And then you have some more types that are defined uh, by composites of shapes. And you want to define a generic draw function that takes some information about a shape and, and renders it um, by composing these primitive uh, functions. One solution to do this is you could make a composite shape um, where you have a vector of boxes and circles and your other primitives. And then the draw function is very simple to write. You could iterate over these vectors. You could also do this with um, inheritance. I'm actually not showing that because it's a very common example. And there's another, uh, well, one disadvantage of this approach is you're losing information in the type system when you have this composite shape approach. Um, if you wanted to distinguish many different kinds of shapes and, and um, make more distinctions between them at compile time, there's no way to, no way to do that. Um, the values are only defined at runtime. So, you know, the, the converse approach of that is, suppose I define uh, different structs um, that uh, are composed of my primitives in a certain layout. So, for example, a capsule or a pill is defined by a box in the middle and two circles at the end. Um, and you can hand code your draw function um, by drawing the circles and drawing the middle. But this is extremely tedious to write the, to just you know, recursively essentially invoke this draw function for all of the information. Um, and imagine writing this for hundreds of objects in a huge code base, and then imagine maintaining that. Uh, imagine trying to add a new primitive shape and then backport um, old shapes. Uh, so it seems like maybe there's a mechanism we're missing. So how about an API that could take the members of a given type, a generic type, uh, from which we could derive this generic function um, where we could look at if the, the members of our type conform to a certain concept at compile time, and then if the draw function was defined, um, which we determined by some compile time predicate, invoke the draw function and render our primitive shape. I'm going to call this introspection. And I'm going to explore what introspection is, what, what different solutions there are in the language today, and what uh, the future proposed solutions in C for maybe C++20, maybe C++23 uh, will look like. First, I'll start with existing solutions. Uh, you could have uh, some people call IDL, interface description language, or schema-based code generation. Uh, you could actually use a compiler or a, a C++ parser to generate reflection information. Uh, you could have a macro. Uh, no external tooling, just using the preprocessor. Or you could use some crazy new stuff. Um, and the particular example I'm going to show uh, uses C17. It's a particular library uh, by Anthony Palookan. Uh, so, one example of this first technique is uh, Cam Proto or Protobuf. It's not, it's not really providing introspection, uh, but there is, Cam Proto actually has a runtime uh, introspection interface 
where you can define a struct. Uh, this top part is not C++. It's their uh, schema definition, uh, where you, it, uh, you, you specify a struct using their schema, and then it generates C++ code. Um, it says, I have a member named name, and then I'm going to generate a function called get name. And because all the code generated using Cap'n Proto conforms to this interface, they have a very efficient serialization library um, that can serialize and deserialize things defined with a struct. But that's very brittle because uh, you, you need to go through their external schema process in order to use Cap'n Proto to serialize anything. Um, so again, they have a generic runtime reflection interface, uh, which I'm not showing here, but it's a way of, uh, instead of directly using these concrete get name, uh, get age, which are generated, um, it, uh, they basically type erase uh, structs that are defined through Cap'n Proto. So uh, the next technique, uh, which is more interesting, I think, for C++ people, is what if you could use a parser? Uh, this is also what uh, Qt mock, the meta, meta object compiler, does, but I don't think it uses libclang. I think it uses their custom parser. Um, and they also get a lot of differences from what I'm showing. This is from uh, C++ a Reflection Engine by Manu Sanchez, um, where he takes C++ code structs, parses it with libclang, and then uses a kind of combination of Python and some templates to then generate uh, compile time structs uh, that you know only have these meta information, uh, no runtime values, um, and then that is used as a basis for a static reflection uh, library. So the disadvantage with this is uh, it's it's not portable, uh, it, and it does require some external um, external tooling. Uh, well. Not portable might, is not accurate, but it, it essentially forces you to use libclang, um, and uh, that, for example, might not be available on Windows yet, um, or might not be reliable on Windows yet. Um, so moving on, uh, also, if you have questions at any point, this goes without saying, but please, you know, just hands up at any point. Uh, so, you know, let's say we're sick of all this external tooling stuff. We don't want to add a, a, a separate uh, build step. We just want to be able to reflect on our members um, in, in C++ code. So you can use a macro. Uh, there's an implementation in Boost Fusion, um, in Boost HANA. Uh, there's also there's a person in this room who wrote a serialization engine called Iguana, who wrote his own uh, reflection macro, where if you pass the types and the names of members of a struct to this macro, it will adapt them to uh, be used in, in kind of this reflection interface with tuple-like access. Um, so this is one way of defining a struct uh, to be used with reflection uh, using define struct. Or if person, the struct we're, uh, we're trying to reflect on, is not defined in your header, you can also adapt it e externally. But the caveat is you have to know the types and the members, you, and you have to pass it to the macro. Uh, so this is an example of how you'd use the result of this definition. Uh, you could write, a, using this uh, heterogeneous for each, uh, you can write a generic print function where we can print the name of the field and the, the value stored in that struct. So this is a very brief overview of how it works. Actually, embarrassingly, the author of uh, the macro I just showed is in the room. So if anything's wrong here, he can correct me. Uh, you Take a look at the macro. Um, the, you look at the name of the uh, member, and you can stringize that to be used. Um, so that's that's how we can convert the uh, the name of the member into a const char star to print it. Uh, you can you can also use that identifier name to get the member pointer, uh, and that's how we're going to uh, set something uh, using the. Oh, I, I didn't show setting, but the set or get something um, from the struct. Uh, and then you, you associate the name and the uh, member pointer in pairs, a tuple of pairs. And then you specialize a lot of templates. Um, and you, you basically, this, the implementation of this macro requires, uh, you know, for, for a max, uh, if, it requires you know, n specializations for some large number of n. Um, and that's the maximum number of members you can reflect on. 
uh, and it's actually generated from a Ruby script um, that generates a C++ macro, and that macro is you know, generating code for you when you write C++. So it's a little, little bit of a monster. <clears throat> um, another really interesting library in this, in this tradition is really cool uh, because it doesn't require you to know and to enumerate the members um, of the struct you're trying to uh, reflect on. So this uh, it used to be called magic get. I think it's now called PFR. Um, what I want to call attention to is this uh, PFR flat get um, of i, where i is a, a, a compile time, or it's a non-type template parameter integer. Um, and I basically, your members will get ordered 0 through n. Uh, and you can use a compile time integer to access your members without any of this annotation stuff. Uh, and the caveat is it only works on pod types, uh, plain old data types. You can't even use standard string. You have to use a const char star here to represent the strings and the, our person struct. Um, so this is a, a similar, like, it, it, you know, I, this isn't using HANA, so I decided to write my own like recursive for each kind of or print function for this, but it's how you'd achieve something similar. Another disadvantage is we don't have the names of the members here, um, unlike in the HANA example. Uh, and so how does it work? Well, there's, it's kind of cool. You can actually, the C++ 17 version of this library doesn't use any macros. Uh, no use of the preprocessor. So that sounds really great, right? Like the preprocessor is terrible and we should get away from it. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> the way it's implemented is it uses structured bindings to destructure uh, a tuple. Um, you, this make tuple of references is doing some kind of crazy stuff with reinterpret casting your, your struct as a tuple and then uh, destructuring uh, the members. And uh, again, this is uh, overloading essentially. Yeah, it's overloading uh, based on the second function argument from zero to 100. And so you, you see there's A, B, A, B, A, B, C, D, E, F, G is or, or the you know, dummy variable she's giving to destructuring. So is this better than a macro? Nah, I don't know. <laughs> so clearly C++ has some catching up to do, I think, because other languages have reflection facilities. Uh, and I'm, so I, I wrote a couple of blog posts on this, or two blog posts on this subject, and I go into a little more depth in those blog posts, and you can Google also for how other languages do reflection. Um, and I, I think all these examples, Python, Java, and C Sharp, uh, they all offer fairly powerful uh, reflection interfaces, but it's, it's, it's essentially all runtime. I mean, in Python, it's, it's a dynamically typed language. All of their structs are essentially dictionaries, uh, so you can do some really powerful stuff with that, but it's at the cost of performance. Um, another really interesting thing about C Sharp that I learned like basically this week is that you can kind of arbitrarily compile C Sharp code at runtime and then use those types. I think Peter is in this room. He knows more about that. I don't know if you want to. Anyway, um, but I, I, another thing I learned just this week, so I added a slide at the last minute, is uh, Dlang, D, which we'll hear a, a keynote about tomorrow. They have some really interesting compile time facilities for the kind of thing that I want to do in C++. Uh, first of all, they have a that underscore underscore traits. Uh, I don't technically know an interface uh, where you can get all the members of a struct. You can get all the overloads of a function. A lot of other stuff. You can get the you know the name as a as a const expr string, um, and they even have this uh, thing called compiles, where for a given expression, you can just check to see if that will compile, um, which is quite powerful. And they have this thing called Mixin, which is, I think, technically what you'd call a hygienic macro, but, excuse me, you can define a um, const char array, and I believe in D that's going to be what we think of as const expert by default. You can write a struct, and then when you call mixin uh, of that result, then that is essentially compiled um, at compile time, uh, and so this uh, I apologize if you're not familiar with the syntax. I'm also just getting used to it. This is like some of the first D code I compiled. Um, you can pass a const expr string to this de definition of this, uh, defining a struct template and then just you know create a foo with a bar member. I think this is pretty cool. Okay, so again, C yes, Louis. This is a little bit like, I mean, this is not too far from the explore code injection 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the comment was, this is not too far from the explored code injection method. And I guess you're referring to the design space for reflection. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very, uh, very flexible. Like, and I think the biggest complaint is this, it, because you're writing code, using, you know, concatenating tokens, it's, it's crude. Um, people want kind of more enforcement of an interface um, through an API, like an EDSL or something. I, we're going to get to that at the end of this talk. <laughs> so as we just mentioned, there's some proposed solutions in C++ for this. Uh, I'm going to focus on two today. The first one that came along, or not the first reflection implementation that came along, but the older of the two I'm going to talk about, uh, I will I call Reflexper. It's based on a paper by <coughs> Matus Choklik. I'm probably horribly mangling his name. I'm sorry, Matus, if you're watching this. Um, and Axel Neumann. Uh, they also co-wrote another paper. Um, they were joined by David Senkel, who's in this room. Hi. Um, <laughs> Uh, called Static Reflection in a Nutshell, which uh, explains the design rationale um, for their API, proposed API. And what's great, what was really fun for me, is they have an implementation in Clang, uh, which was uh, primarily by Matus, um, and decent documentation. This is a, a very, very simple example of what it looks like. Uh, you use the reflex per keyword on uh, a type, and that returns another type, uh, which is a, a, a templated type that carries the information about the struct. Um, and then you use a series of meta functions such as get base name, which gets the name of the struct as a const char array. Um, get size returns the uh, number of members. Um, and they'll, I'll introduce more as we see them in code examples. So the other reflection implementation uh, I'll sometimes call operator dollar sign. Um, or CPP3K because that's the name of the, uh, the you know, uh, utility header uh, for this API. Uh, so it was released after the original Reflexper paper um, by Andrew Sutton and Herb Sutter. They also have a uh, reference implementation in Clang. Uh, the, the dollar sign is a little bit controversial because it's, uh, compilers disagree about whether or not that's a valid identifier. But I, I, th that's a, for me, that's just a bike shed issue. Uh, I don't care about that that much. Uh, I, I care more about what the power of the API is. Uh, how can we measure that? What will this allow me to do? And also, what does it look like? Like, is it expressive? Yeah, is it something I'd like to use? Okay, the dollar sign is like one part of that because it's just one character. But some people complain it looks like Perl. Uh, this is what using it looks like, which I consider more important. Um, and you use the dollar sign to uh, reflect on a type, and that gives you a const expr value uh, back. And you query that using value semantics. So you can use meta info dot name to get the array as a const char star. Um, you can do dot member variables, and that gives you this sequence. It's not a tuple, it's something different. Uh, and then you can query the size of that. Which API is better? Well, this is a question. I think this is a bit of a misleading question. Uh, but I do want to do a little bit of comparisons using examples. Uh, and I want this to be an example-driven talk to kind of ground us in reality. Um, one note is the static reflection in a nutshell paper does say uh, maybe the, the we, we want to provide a really basic API. And we, we do expect people to build some metaprogramming um, F facilities on top of that, um, depending on like their use case and also like what semantics they prefer. Um, I think that's a point of discussion. But one example of what you can do ref with reflection um, is you can create a generic equality operator uh, for a given type um, or determine if it's impossible to create such a thing. So I'm going to refer to record types. And when I refer to a record type, I mean something that has members. Roughly, it may have a more technical pedantic definition, um, but uh, if I want to, I have a type T, and I have a you know two, I have a, a TA and a TB, and I want to determine if they are uh, if they're equal values, not if they're the same, not if they point to the same uh, address in memory, uh, but if all of their if their record types and all of their sub members compare to be equal. So uh, suppose I have 
a concept, maybe, or some compile term predicate that says t is equality comparable. Um, it has a, a val, you know, and for this purpose, it, just, it has a valid equal equal. Um, I will return a equals equals b. Uh, if it's iterable, um, maybe I can do something where I have a data structure where I can go through every member and uh, compare if those are equal. Obviously, if they're a different size, like if this is a vector, it can't be equal, so we return false. Okay, but, uh, and this is say, you know, kind of these like heuristics for how we compare a T. Uh, but what, uh, what if T is a record type and we don't immediately know how to equality compare them? Uh, we can get all of the members of the T using uh, reflection, get data members from the result of reflex per T. And then for each of our data members, uh, we have to access the value um, and then recursively call equal um, to see, to uh, get the result of the submembers if those are equal. So uh, this metaphor each that I'm using is another facility provided by the Reflexper uh, utilities, which is a function that takes um, a lambda and in the angle brackets, you give it the sequence that you want to iterate over. Um, another important thing we'll keep seeing over and over again is the way we do accesses with the fork right now is we have to get the member pointer out of the, um, using the meta information, which is like a little bit scary looking, pro probably for like novices. Uh, some people in the room are like shaking their head being like, what is this? <laughs> uh, so comparing this is what the other uh, fork of Clang looks like, it's shorter. Um, they also have a metaphor each, uh, rather than taking a sequence in the angle brackets, it's the first uh, argument, the uh, t.member variables. Um, and it's similar. So, okay, you may have some observations, complaints, whatever. Um, I'll predict them here. Um, comparing them, you might say, hey, I really like the, the second implementation a lot better. Um, it's shorter and it looks a little more natural. Um, okay, sure. Uh, what, I, what I really don't like about this example is that the for each is potentially very inefficient um, and also maybe uh, hard to use, like logically difficult because it requires an initial valid state or basically an identity for our, our operation. Luckily with equality we have that the, because the, um, the identity for and is, is one or true. Uh, but another th problematic thing is the for each construct doesn't allow us to early return or short circuit, um, which we can, yes? Technically you can do it by like probably exception. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great point. Um, and another thing that uh, may concern you is, uh, what about public versus private? Uh, I, don't, I didn't see any of those words on the, that slide. And um, you know, how, how should those be considered in this? Uh, Compare as an operator. Okay, so the first, I, I want to address the second point first. I think fold expressions are a really nice way to solve that problem. Um, so this is, I, I had a lightning talk about folding expressions yesterday where I gushed about them. And um, But the, the thing with fold expressions is you need to have a parameter pack in order to fold over that. The reflexber fork does provide this thing called unpack sequence or an unpack sequence colon colon type or underscore t. And that says if you have a struct that takes a pack, a dot dot dot, um, a, a variadic template arguments, and if you pass get data members to that pack, um, that will unpack it as, as a sequence. But if you don't use that, this get data members is not, cannot be understood as a parameter pack on itself. So it's like a little annoying to use. Um, but it does allow us to write this nice fold expression uh, where we, uh, we don't have the initial state problem anymore because the fold expression will just take the first result of the operation. Um, and uh, the compiler can optimize this better than if we go through the metaphor each uh, because the fold expression is basically expanding these different uh, results and with, it has and and in between them. Um, so the and and will, could be short circuited um, by the compiler. Um, I didn't, I apologize, I didn't take benchmarks for this assertion, so I could be wrong, but I think it could work. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to address is this access specifiers discussion. 
So in the current state of the implementation that I, I worked with, um, understand that with the proposals, things are always changing, is by default, get data members and uh, the member variables in, in the other uh, implementation uh, reflects on all public members. Uh, in the reflects per implementation, there's a get public data members, which will only give you the public data members. Uh, and both of the implementations provide an is public or an is private for a meta information. So at compile time, you can determine if a certain member is public or private. So it, you know, if you have something that gives you all the data members, you can then switch on the, uh, if this is private, then don't do anything with it. So as you can imagine, by pricing private is really, really easy uh, with this implementation. So uh, actually, I'm going to say easier because in the language as it is today, um, there, you can by bypass private using some crazy stuff. Um, and there's a blog post. You can Google bypassing private in C++ to find it. But this is like way easier uh, because we're, when you use meta information to get the, um, the when, you, when you get data members, you can get an element using a compile time index. And then you can get a member pointer from that. Um, and this will actually compile. Um, and it, it actually won't reach this assertion. So I'm able to take the private member x out of a and copy it into y in b in the constructor of b. So this may give you the heebie-jeebies, um, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, yes, Alistair? I say um, accessing private members is not really scary because you're not violating any invariants of the class. Modifying private members might be scarier. Right. I know your example so far are pulling, so it's exactly. not scary yet. David? So I can give some kind of motivation for why we're doing this. It's because they wanted to make sure that um, if, you, if you only use get public members, then you know the code is safe. So they can very easily grab for that. Um, and then there's something that's been added on top of this, which is get all the members based on what kind of scope you're in. If you're in a scope where you can get private members, then you can get those. Um, but there's still get all members you want. So, yeah, my general feeling is I think if we get reflection soon, um, my, the guideline is going to be you should uh, reflect on public member data by default and continue the, the guideline with access specifiers we already have, which is use private members for implementation details. That way, if you are serializing something, for example, you're going to avoid uh, having kind of like compatibility issues between serialization formats. Um, I do think it's very uncommon, actually, to have the um, what I showed on this slide, which is I'm, I'm using zero or a compile name index to directly grab a member pointer, um, but you can do it. Um, so I, I, it, it does seem like in order to uh, follow the rule that uh, arbitrarily modifying private members from any scope is 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 not a good feature of the language then the, I think it seems like this, the wording in the standard should be made careful for that um, and I think also think the get public data members convenience uh, accessor is like very important for that reason um, yes uh, I have a question about well, since you mentioned serialization is there any way for us for in, in either, of these, either of these proposals to specify a subset which we're going to say only the serializable members and I can myself annotate which ones I'm going to sh actually show a code example of serialization. Okay. I don't do exactly that, but I'll try to point out where you can, can switch on that. Yeah. Huh. That's funny. So the way that we're doing the proposal is we're trying to do the minimal subset. Yeah. And then there was later on we'll be doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm asking how the discussion takes place. I don't remember the exact how the discussion. There, there hasn't been a proposal for it, shouldn't be so. Yeah, uh, since, uh, sorry, I don't know your name, in the audience mentioned this, it's very timely. My next example will be, how do we do serialization and deserialization? Actually, so uh, Louis at Meeting C++ 2016 in his keynote showed like a one slide JSON serializer example using uh, value semantics, metaprogramming, on top of Reflexbear, at the time the other fork hadn't, uh, or the other proposal hadn't even come out yet. I'm going to show deserialization today, since you know JSON serialization with reflection that's already been done. <laughs> um, I 
this is actually going to have a lot of overlap with Matt Calabrese's talk from earlier today. So uh, if you saw that, uh, I apologize. Oh, th there'll be some other stuff too. Um, and again, a lot of the the string parsing and the API itself is it. This is a bit of a toy example. Um, so if you see like, oh, this is you're not perfect forwarding here. Like, it's okay. Like, I mean, feel free to point it out. But I, I more want to point out how uh, I think what, what common patterns I think we're going to need um, if we get reflection. So the interesting thing here is, uh, I, I guess I'm not going to. I deleted a slide where it would be a good time to answer your question. So uh, the the way this deserialized function works is you uh, it's similar to the equality. Uh, well, okay, serialization is is very similar to the equality uh, example. You are looking at a struct and you if const expr over some concepts, you know, compile time predicate about the struct. Um, you can say like, if I'm serializing into JSON. If it's a string, uh, I can just write name of my member the string. Um, if it's an int, yeah, I know how to convert an int to a string. Uh, easy. Then in that kind of compile time switch, you could say, if this is not a type, I, like if I know this is not serializable, I'm just going to skip it. Um, and then what I do um, in this example is uh, if this is a record member, if it, ha uh, if it has members, I'm going to use reflection. And that is when we use reflection to look at the members of the record and then recursively call de uh, serialize or deserialize. So in this case, in, in, when we have deserialize, it's, we, we can't just use compile time information about the struct because we have this input that's determined at runtime. So uh, imagine, I probably should have written some JSON on the slide, but uh, imagine you have a key that refers to the name of a member. How do you know what field in the struct to map the, the corresponding value to? Well, you have to map, essentially you have to map a, a runtime value to a compile time value. Um, this is a pattern that's the kind of the backbone of variant visitation. Uh, and if you're in Matt's talk, we kind of implemented that using his library. Uh, I, I'm gonna also talk about that today. So one really naive way of doing this is, okay, imagine you have, uh, like, for one level of your JSON object, you have all the keys, all the JSON keys, and then you have the strings representing the values for those keys. Uh, and you also have a T um, that has member variables. I'm going to take my key and my value, and I'm going to say for each of my member variables, if the key matches the name of the member variable, which we know through reflection, um, which is a compile time value, but I can compare a runtime value to a compile time value, then deserialize it. Um, and we, again, use access using the member pointer. So this is, might seem, yes, Jeff. So a quick question, the, the deserialize, is that a user written function or where does that come from exactly? Is that something you're gonna generate? Yeah, it, deserialize is something I'm writing and I'm recursively calling it. Would, um, if we have time at the end, I'll show you guys the full example. I, I omitted like a lot of the code to show that what I, the highlights, but I guess the reason yeah. I'm bringing it up is because you can imagine for for a moment that your in-memory representation is an integer value and your external representation is a string, and so it's not as simple as it might seem to just serialize and deserialize by changing the type. So uh, the comment is. Your in-memory representation might be an integer. Your value is a string. Right. So it's a date, 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And internally it's an integer. Yeah. So uh, I think in order to handle that, uh, you would have to have a customization point for deserialize yeah. that says uh, this type in my struct is a date. And then the, uh, the overload for deserialize for date does something with that string that's completely different. Um, yeah, I, I don't get to that because I, I think that's kind of more of a deserialization. Uh, like, this is not a talk on deserialization. This is a talk on reflection. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, that's kind of a defer. <laughs> but, no, but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is I think obviously I can see where reflection would really help serialization, but there's got to be these customization points. Otherwise, you won't really be able to do it. 
It's a common counter argument because some people are like, I really need reflection for serialization. It's amazing. And other people have that same example where they're like, well, I have so many special cases for my types for serialization that it doesn't matter. Like, I can't just auto deduce that. Uh, I think it depends on a lot of factors. Like, it depends on the kind of code base you're working in. Uh, my motivation was I was working in robotics and uh, working on this framework where we had message types for a lot of mathematical um, mathematical types, um, a lot of like kind of custom messages, the kind of thing people use JSON on the web for, like control uh, things. So then there was like a lot of repetition. I think at almost any case where you're using a code generator, like the first example of Cap'n Proto, use it, you have a code generator and a schema specification, and that's just generating code blindly um, for serialization. You could just use reflection instead. Um, yes? Yeah. The comment was in C sharp, they use reflection, but they also use like serialization traits for as a customization point, essentially. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on a bit. Uh, as I said, this is kind of, uh, kind of a, the same pattern of this re recursive call over all the members. It's that's quite simple um, once you understand the syntax, I think. And then the string matching. Uh, for me, I wrote this and I was like, this is gonna be like really bad runtime performance. Usually. Uh, when we do metaprogramming, it's like, okay, this might take a really long time to compile, but I know that I'm pushing some cost from compile time to runtime, but this is basically O of N string comparisons per member in the struct. Uh, okay, hold that thought. I want to, yes, Alistair. I say, but in these cases, N is typically going to be tiny. Right. So we're probably not going to be too concerned. Yeah, like, uh, okay, what's, what's the average number of members in a struct? Fifteen. <laughs> Four. Four. I one another question is like, for an aggregate type, like not just one level of a struct, but like, you know, you take, you have a, a struct that has many many subcomponents. Is that is that more like yeah okay? I I'd actually I'd love to see some data on that if anyone has if the like larger companies like Bloomberg or Google have collected data on that. So I wanted to do another practical. Uh, example to ground us in reality again, uh, and that's program options. Really common problem is parsing argc and argv. Like almost every program does this, right? <laughs> um, so what what if we wrote this cool library where we could write a struct called program options, and it you know it's a, maybe it's a pretty simple flat struct um, that defines members with names of things that map directly to their argument flags on the command line. So for example, standard string file name, you'd specify setting that in program options as dash dash file name or dash f. Uh, and the interface to our um, toy library is just parse argc argv, um, and it's gonna return an optional uh, that is null opt if, there, if we found an invalid flag or if there was something weird about the uh, argument vector. So the way we're going to do this uh, is we're going to use HANA for as a, basically for the compile time map. Uh, and we're going to reflect on the program options struct, uh, look at the name of the member, and uh, make a flag, uh, make, collect the flags out of that, then map that to the meta info from reflection that we get in a map. And uh, just as a really simple example, we're going to choose, select the next character if we find a kind of a collision in the map, if, if the flags are, the short flag has already been taken. And, and if we can't do that for now, we're just saying, uh, you know, I couldn't think of a clever way to arrange your flags, so static assert. Uh, if, you know, if, if I were to spend more time on this and uh, have people actually use it, uh, you know, there, there should be a way to add a customization point for custom flags, of course, um, and also for help. Um, but this is the kind of the, the bare bones of super minimal program options. Uh, at runtime, the parse function is going to iterate over argv. We're gonna do the same thing we did before, where we have to convert a runtime determined uh, string, uh, in this case it's a C style string, 
um, into a const expr string uh, to index into the map uh, to get the information about how to set the thing in the program, the, the value in the program options struct. Uh, this is the uh, basic uh, kind of a part of the implementation uh, using the reflex for API. Uh, we I haven't pictured this uh, collect flags lambda, which is doing exactly what I just said, uh, and this is what it looks like using uh, the other fork, where we I, I had to write. This is kind of annoying uh, in the state of the code right now is I had to write my own function to adapt their tuple representation to HANA. And I also couldn't use std apply because they don't use standard tuple. So this is a bit of a nitpick, but it's like I'd like to see a consistent set of data structures that play well with each other. Um, if you have some questions about that, uh, or if, if you have ideas about like the design for this, then let me know. Or, or let the people writing the papers know. <laughs> uh, one of the things that, that I want to point out from these, these slides that, that came up uh, is this collect flags uh, lambda uh, in the fold expression to henna uh, is kind of annoying because we have to deal with uh, const expr strings. And there is not a standard way to deal with those yet. Um, in fact, the, uh, the common syntactic sugar to make them nicer, which is using a user-defined literal, is like not even, uh, for, for, for a user-defined literal of, of a character pack, it's like not even a, a standard compiler thing. It's a new compiler extension, so that's great. Uh, there's also, in the different forks, there's different representations right now. So in Reflexpr, they decided on const char array um, of size. So n is determined at compile time, um, and I don't remember if you can actually grab that from the like get base name length. Um, the t, you know, dollar sign t.name is a const char star. Um, it's kind of annoying is because you can't pass these into functions because you can't have const expr function parameters. Uh, and also, this is more just an implementation detail, but the henna map that I'm using, uh, the, I couldn't get this to work, but uh, like the keys have to be henna strings. Um, they didn't work with a different, uh, like just a const char star uh, or a const char, yeah. So that is because if you compare const star stars, well, first of all, you're, comp you're comparing values. values. So that's just what you want. But also, yeah. there are different rules, and that is, if you don't count them, it's cool. Yep. That, that is the whole story of the aggressive parameters, so that's why they did it. Yep. Yes, David. Um, I would just point out that the latest version of the paper, we're returning not a const char to n anymore, we're doing a, what was that thing you just said? Numeric constant? of like char pointer or something like that. We're doing something crazy. But it's just there. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you it's had an... as a stand-in for getting reals compiled in strings. So that's what's up. If you had an integral constant of a const char star, that still wouldn't help. Yeah, that will. That will? Oh. Yeah. Oh, my God. If you're null terminated, it's going to work. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it has, so it has you because you can implement like a const expr sterlen using that. Uh, right. But just do const expr const, right? And yep, 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 yep. But by default, your your default equal which Hana is going to use, you're going to do it. You're going to get a pointer, so you're going to have to check that. Wait, so if you go constant right now, couldn't the const char star just like I don't know, the value? <laughs> that's 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 the whole issue around. Okay, we'll talk about const expr strings later. Uh, I have a, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't have access to uh, good facilities for dealing with compile time strings, and I was too lazy to write them myself. So I have essentially a stopgap solution um, for dealing with these, which is uh, unpacking the, uh, the results of the reflection name um, and doing some crazy stuff with uh, index sequences and then putting it in a HANA string and then just not dealing with the strings afterward. Um, if I had a, a library with an API where uh, const expr strings were like something that the user of the library had to deal with, I feel like we uh, there, there's a, a solution that's uh, not in the standard library right now and that's, you know, 
uh, there's something missing. There, there are facilities that are missing. Um, do you want to? Okay. Cool. <laughs> uh, okay. So besides that, um, me complaining. <laughs> uh, we're we're gonna see a similar pattern to deserialization in this implementation because this is essentially deserialization. What we're doing. Uh, we. Uh, I'm following this again linear pattern of uh, looking at the keys. This runtime string compare thing is. I think Louis was alluding to the fact that Hana equal will compare. Oh no, actually that's not relevant because Hana equal um, on const char stars will compare the pointer, not the values. Um, but I, runtime string compare uh, here is actually a facility that will do will, will go over every character and compare them, um, probably using a fold expression. <laughs> um, the after seeing the deserialization example, this is kind of repetition where we. We access the map, we get this meta info, um, we get a pointer out of the meta info, uh, we get the type out of the meta info as well. Uh, I think there's a bug in the current implementation, again, of the CPP3K fork, where what I'd like to do is say decal type info colon colon type, and that for that to just work, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work for uh, templated types. So Unreflect member right now is this crazy thing that uses um, decal val and decal type, <laughs> um, which I, yeah, if you're curious, I'll, I'll show you later. Um, and uh, for, because uh, we're, we're dealing with kind of simple primitives right now, we're going to do a lexical cast. And um, that's why we need to get the type out, is because the interface for boost, lex boost lexical cast requires you to specify the type um, and use a member pointer to set that. OK, so I wanted to see if this work I was doing, um, playing around with ref reflection, was any improvement at all on boost program options, uh, which uh, raise your hand if you've, if you've used boost program options. Yeah, it's, it's a very commonly used uh, facility for this problem. Uh, boost program options requires you to collect uh, a map, a variable map of options, um, and then when you, after you parse it, uh, you, um, parse argc and argv, uh, you have to do an any cast to get your values out of the um, out of the variable map. So the intuition is not having taken a close look at the implementation at all. The intuition is maybe this uh, kind of strongly typed uh, approach is going to be better in some way. Uh, so. As a back of the napkin benchmark, I, I went with binary size. Um, again, as we know from using like OFAST, uh, the, the size of a binary is not correlated with its speed, uh, but it's, oh, this is a graph that's not showing up. I'm so sorry, guys. <sighs> OK. Sorry. I, I would like to show this, so I'm just going to run into um, some. Yeah, this is terrible. Uh, OK, yeah, so uh, I, I also did a, a kind of a ridiculous benchmark, which is I, I generated a benchmark for up to 45 arguments. And it's very rare you're going to have 45 arguments to a program. <laughs> um, this is, a, this is uh, I, I, gener I had a script that generated just like uh, a struct with members. Uh, yes, Alistair? So when you say arguments, you mean? Essentially, fields in the program options, doesn't exactly. Arguments on the command line. Exactly. So I, I generated uh, sources with uh, a struct with five members with randomly selected names um, in increments of five up to forty-five, and I compiled them. I think at O three, and uh, compared their binary sizes, um, and I varied it over such a a large size simply because I wanted to see. What the uh, what what the scaling factor looked like, um, and so luckily the blue is the example that I made, um, and it it is smaller, um, but it it does seem to like grow faster in the small region, which I'm curious, but I haven't done a lot of uh, analysis on this either. Um, so it, because we're doing less work, uh, we're, we're ending up with a smaller binary. I I do think that if I added some facilities to add help strings. To this example, then this binary size would go up because we're adding. If we added like a really long help string describing our option, 
Uh, and that's stored at compile time. That's going to increase our binary size. Uh, but again, I wanted to show this as uh, we're, we're not just writing code for, for the hell of it. We're accomplishing something. Just one small question. You have a yes. asymptote around 25 uh, uh, arguments. Ah, uh, yes. Did, did you find out why? No, I didn't. <laughs> I, was one, I was thinking that uh, it may, I was wondering that, um, about that because program options might level out because they actually might have a limit on the number of arguments, um, or they might start dynamically allocating stuff. Um, yes, David? Uh, did you also do a spread on compilation please? No. Yeah. What is the difference, like, using it? So I... Because I'm generating a lot of benchmarks, yes, it does take a long time to compile, but not like hours. Um, the benchmarks take like minutes. Uh, but yeah, I think that that is a, an important point. So with reflection, um, the, my intuition is that the stuff that the implementation adds uh, will, it's, it's like a constant factor in the normal compilation times because it's just exposing stuff the compiler is already doing. Um, but I haven't taken speed benchmarks. Yes, Zach. So I think uh, Gabi Vanderbilt was the one who brought this up in the last meeting we've been discussing this and he said that he, he wants to do the object um, oriented way of doing it in, instead of the type system oriented way of doing it. Um, simply because he said even though you're reflecting things that already exist in the compiler, with an object you can just give that to, to someone with a template instantiation that comes with the, the template-based one, you have to also instantiate a template just to communicate that same information. So he's afraid that with something with like a ton of uh, reflection generated code for let's say a large amount of serialization or something, you get like hundreds of thousands of template instantiations you didn't want and very long compile times you achieve. I was thinking that might be the reason for the asymptotes. The As in at some point the template starts it's overlapping and they, yeah. they are um, um, memoized. Yeah. So you don't get more templates. Yeah. That could be. How does the compiler memoize templates, the uh, ty instantiated types in that way? Uh, from what I understand, if you have the template with the same kind of type, then it would just reuse the same instance. Right. But if I have a, if for the uh, Reflexpert implementation, for example, um, I have a different type for each member, then how will it know to memoize the... It would not memoize the... the right, right, right. So, so... It depends on whether the instantiations end up going into things that are the same underneath at some point. Exactly. I see. Okay. So it okay. On how different they are. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. Yep. My guess for, so, so this is data now, right? My guess, my guess for why the size is, is stagnating at some point, or rather why there's a gap, uh, is there, it, it could be, it could be something mm -hmm. else completely, but it could be that there's uh, some better inlining going on for the small sizes, and then at some point, uh, the command will start giving up and there's more code to be generated. Uh, and, and, you know, once you kind of go past a point where, okay, the, 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 the optimizer is not doing such a good job anymore, uh, there's less, you know, way more uh, code to be generated. Like, you can't really tell the difference between one and, and you know, n and, and so forth. That is just like a theory like sure. that. But I've seen stuff like that before. Yes, I Did you also strip, like, RTTI and type info and stuff? As, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a really rigorous benchmark, as you can see. <laughs> if, if, if you're doing a lot of uh, TMP stuff, it could make a large difference. In binary size, yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Are there, um, are there more points on this discussion? Okay, cool. Uh, so, kind of touched on a lot of these uh, points. I did want to point out that for this example, for this problem of um, of program options, what, what I'd really like is to have attributes. I'd like to have user-defined attributes and reflection on attributes. Uh, I think that this is, it's another way to express information about our types that right now is a bit underserved in the language. Um, and uh, I, but I think that if, if for example, someone decide to write a paper about user-defined attributes, um, it would need to mesh well with reflection and that we would also want to add reflection on attributes. Um, so uh, I also 
what, what I want to point out is, even though Alistair mentioned that we're going to have a really small number of members um, for uh, in, in the kinds of types we deal with with reflection, uh, I, I'm concerned about this linear runtime string matching. Uh, I saw it and I was like, I don't like to pay runtime cost. So maybe as a thought experiment, we can see how we can make this better. So uh, with, I decided to write a string hash so that we could uh, compare the runtime strings in our examples in deserialization and in program options in constant time. Uh, so here's what would be really cool. What if we could implement a perfect hash from our set of strings to uh, unique integers, and then those unique integers to index into our uh, our type at compile time. So, again, uh, the the runtime to compile time uh, matching is has been looked at before um, for implementing standard variant, but that is essentially looking at integers uh, because the active type of a variant is represented as a as an integer. Uh, so, how do we do this for strings? Well, if we take a, the result of a hash is going to be an integer, um, but it's not going to be necessarily be a sequential in integer that we can use as an index into that type. Uh, so we're going to need to do kind of two steps of hashing. And another thing is, I'd like to be able to compute this hash both at runtime and compile time, uh, so then I can do things like detect if there's collisions, um, to test it, or I can do things like um, determine the set of integers that we get from the hash, and then uh, map that to sequential integers. Because I might not necessarily get sequential integers out of my hash initially. So I did this. It's pretty fun. <laughs> um, the really uh, short and simple implementation, I'm calling it the simple string hash, is uh, I take, I look at my set of strings, at compile time, and I get the max length from the to total, um, the names of my members, essentially, if this is reflection, uh, if this is for the reflection use case. Um, but this isn't closely coupled to reflection. Uh, then I define the hash function, and here I'm overloading operator paren to be fancy, to pretend like I'm a function. <laughs> uh, I uh, add up the value of the keyword at index i, and I multiply that by its index offset by 1, and I add it up. And I can also do this at compile time. Um, using Here I'm actually using a custom string literal class, uh, which was which is based heavily on, it's, it's similar to the HANA implementation, sort of written as, as an exercise for myself, um, but uh, it's a different way of writing this hash at compile time. And yes, Louis. Can you go back one step? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, by just adding a uh, <coughs> context for string length, you just have your length, right? And, and uh, I think the name is context, but you could just throw a context in there and you wouldn't have these trouble with each other. Does that make sense? Uh, so. For the uh, parameter, because uh, it takes const star star keyword as a context for parameter, would that work? Yeah. Like, so oh yeah, yeah, because if you have context for Sterling, it takes it. Yeah. Faiza. Cool. I think that might work. Yeah. You shouldn't have to, uh, you shouldn't need to duplicate this mistake. Yeah, it is really bothering me that it's duplicated. Um, okay. So uh, I just noticed that I'm sort of low on time, so I'm going to start rushing through this a bit since this is kind of side material. Um, this is, we, we still need to uh, map from the result of this hash because um, the way we wrote it is we're, we're adding like, ASCII values together, so we're, we end up with actually very large numbers. It's really far from being from zero to n. So we have another level of hashing 
from from runtime integers to compile time integers. Um, and this is I, here I use a recursive switch statement uh, where I take seek in this example is the uh, the known set re result of our string hash. Um, and then I map that to uh, sequential um, indices. Uh, so I wanted to benchmark this because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and I uh, simply, I kind of generalized the stuff from the deserialize uh, example into this thing, uh, which is a, it, expressing the same thing in a very terse way. Um, and it, uh, without optimizations, it did really well. Uh, so the red is the uh, hopefully it is the hashing example, and the uh, blue is the linear example. And with optimizations, um, oh the legend got cut off a bit in this slide. Sorry. With optimizations, uh, we, we can see that the linear example grows linearly from uh, zero to fifty, um, and the uh, red is actually for for a small number of arguments there isn't a huge uh, amount of difference. Uh, so this is, for anyone who's like, sorry, uh, this, this is runtime speed. Um, so I in order, uh, executed 1 million hashes and averaged that over 100 runs um, and, and measured the total time. Uh, so um, you might say that for the case I'm really interested in is, you know, doesn't exceed 10. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be more like five for the members of my struct. I'm never going to get up to 50. That might not necessarily, necessarily be true. There might be structs that have like hundreds of members. <laughs> so I think for that case, it's very, it would be very important to consider implementing a string hash. Yes, Stephen? So what if you wanted to implement your parameter thing for GCC? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> So I should say I've tested very little of the code in this presentation on GCC because the reflection examples uh, are only in forks of Clang. However, the um, the string hashing work that I've done, it, because there's no dependency on reflection, um, it yeah, it should yeah it should be fine. But uh, there. Uh, like, whenever I can try to compile it with GCC, the other differences in how GCC and Cling have implemented 17, um, and I tend to abuse fault expressions um, and some other features. Uh, it actually doesn't compile with GCC right now in the current state of the code. Um, so that's, but you were saying, well, yeah. I'm just, just saying, if you, if you want to test, He has a lot of arguments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Fair point. Also, I haven't. Uh, I think a, a cool use case for the program options example is is with nested arguments. So if you could. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, so imagine having like dash dash something dot something, and then having that uh, deserialize into a nested member of a struct. Um, but uh, going back to string hashing, OK, you might ask, like, is, this is like barely even relevant to reflection. Um, I don't disagree. Um, there's also a lot of implementation caveats. So actually, in this use case, you'd want to, uh, you'd want to have a hash from 0 to n uh, characters for all strings. Because imagine if your user is typing in program options at the command line, it makes a typo. Um, well, that typo string is not in your string hash set, which I illustrated. Uh, so you actually want to be, be able to handle all strings. And if you want to handle all strings um, from 0 to n, that's a, like a really, really big number. And you're going to actually, yes? So have you considered instead of doing a hash, doing something like building a DFA? Uh, yeah, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> so the suggestion was build a, a DFA instead of a, a hash. Um, I also I think uh, the the principle of this is, in order to make metaprogramming more practical, we need to think about ways to map efficiently from runtime to compile time, not just from integers, uh, but make more complex data structures, um, and to push down that conversion to 
uh, logarithmic or constant time. Um, and I think that opens up a lot of possibilities for how this discipline can be more useful. And reflection also makes metaprogramming, I think, more useful and brings it to the forefront of tools in a programmer's toolbox. Okay, so this is something that we were discussion, discussing already, um, and a lot of that conversation probably wasn't captured by the camera, so I'll kind of reiterate. Um, in, with type-based metaprogramming, uh, so if you're, if you're instantiating a lot of types, if you have values that you represent as types and then you instantiate them, uh, that could hurt your binary size or your compilation speeds. Um, if you use, if, if you're crazy like Odin and you implement <laughs> continuations using using declarations, you could actually have compile times that are really fast. Um, but I still, I think that most people agree that the API that they prefer is something more with value semantics. And the point that, um, that came up in our previ earlier conversation was that David has said that um, with value semantics, you're not instantiating types, you're dealing with constructs per values and that is actually cheaper. Um, so that's another benefit besides the kind of the saving human time that a value semantics metaprogramming paradigm brings. Um, I, again, I apologize for not presenting you guys benchmarks, uh, but I also kind of felt that these implementations do not represent the final product. Uh, uh, one thing that I learned through doing this presentation is the designs are still evolving and also uh, there's a lot of quality of implementation issues for the compiler. Um, and I think a, a presentation that presented a lot of compile speed benchmarks um, should be on a more polished product. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're gonna shift gears. Uh, we, we looked a lot at, at real code that does compile. I, I'm gonna show the link to my examples uh, at the end of the presentation. And we're gonna look further into the future. One thing that isn't really hammered down yet, uh, but, but is being worked on is function reflection. Uh, there is a, a limited facility for this in, in the CPP3K implementation, which is, um, it has some limited facilities, which are still really useful. So if you've ever written a really cryptic function to get the arity of uh, an invocable or a callable, or whatever we're calling it these days, or maybe just a function object, um, what if you could just do reflect on my function and get the size of the parameters, and that's the arity. It's great. And then this is very fictional and um, doesn't exist yet. But what if we could reflect on overloads so that given the name of a function, we got a sequence representing, that was a representation of all the, the function, the, like the overload set of that function. Um, but you know, the, and what if like we could hammer down the overload uh, ordering rules such that the ordering of the, the overloads in the sequence was actually like the precedence of overloads. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not enough of a language lawyer to design this, I think, or really to make decisions about it, but I, I think it, Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, it would depend on the, the, the call site. Um, and it would also, there, there's a lot of issues with the syntax to reflect on the name of a function um, because a lot of people want to be able to reflect on lambdas. So we would also have to, I, I think uh, we, we want to be able to reflect on um, a, a broader set than just member functions. We want to reflect on lambdas and um, function objects, like things that can be called. Um, and and this, this starts to get very complicated quickly. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I also think that there, before we go too far with one reflection design, uh, we should address kind of an elephant in the room, uh, which is that everything that's been proposed and implemented so far is just introspection. Uh, and I'm gonna have some redundant slides with many, several other presentations that either will be or have already been presented at this conference, but hopefully that, that will serve as a data point that this is an important issue. Uh, so I wanna be able to change identifiers at compile time. And 
I want to be able to do this because once you've reflected on an object, it, you can do cool things with data layout, but there are all these facilities that would make programming easier um, that we can only really unlock if we can kind of implement traits or uh, play around more, like make new classes based on the, now that we've unlocked reflection information, we want to use that as in, in, uh, inputs to another kind of set of templates that we can write. So this is more completely fictional syntax um, that is not implemented yet. Uh, it's sometimes, it, I think in the uh, Reflexper papers, some, it's you know, initially been uh, referred to as ID Reflexper. Um, Peter Bindel in his talk called it Rayify. And uh, I'm gonna give it another name because I feel that ID Reflexper is too closely tied to reflection. Um, ID decal is like identifier declaration. Uh, but, but it's missing the export suffix. Do, do you think it should be ID expert? Uh, every, every new keyword should have expert. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so easy to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. so we should end up with expert. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th this is why I wanted to, I showed the D example in the beginning, uh, because C++ currently has nothing that achieves what I'm about to show. So imagine we could use ID decal, and given the uh, data members resulting from a reflection expression, uh, what if you could actually um, pack expand that in a member declaration? And this is some more fictional syntax. <laughs> and uh, what if that pack expansion could also be in lockstep with getting the member types? So we could declare the member types, and then we could declare the names of those members in order. So the result of this um, in, in my fictional land is A of person is going to have all of the same members as person. Uh, and, and this is a total toy example because it achieves it essentially achieves like hack inheritance. You know, how is this any different? Or you know, it feels like it's actually worse than inheritance because I haven't recorded that there's a relationship between these structs. Well, I actually think this is cooler than inheritance because you could filter on a predicate about those data members, and rather than inheriting from a, something, you could have a more expressive relationship between them. So, for example. You could say, I want to get all of the pod members of T for some reason. Maybe that like is, defines something like that defines that this is serializable, or that defines uh, that I can do a safe operation with these. Uh, as uh, as has come up frequently, you can implement mocking with this. Uh, so you would need some kind of map from uh, the uh, the uh, requirements of your your mocking interface. Um, and you could declare uh, the um, a set of member functions with the same name and the same uh, signature. And this is where the syntax starts, I think, really falling on its head uh, because there's so many things we're trying to express here that are impossible in the language right now. Uh, trying to have a, a pack expand in a member declaration, trying to have this like generic args, this is the kind of stuff that we, we achieve with macros today frequently, but um, we're, we're introducing tons of new language constructs in this uh, slide, and it's, it's totally a mess. So there's some ideas in another paper, uh, which was written by David and Louis, and it's called Exploring the Design Space of Metaprogramming Reflection. And that makes the point that um, we can't, move forward with reflection unless we have better facilities for metaprogramming in the library, for dealing with compile time sequences, um, for dealing with the, the issue of, of declaring an identifier at compile time um, rather than you know, doing some hack with the preprocessor. So this is a, maybe a cleaned up version, but it's still a bit odd because we have a const expert for in the in a, a struct declaration. I don't know if that's a part of the, your proposal, but um, being able to have a constexpr block and a for within the 
like in in a struct definition context. Yes. Oh, cool. Well, that's one of the things that you're supposed to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the uh, a huge boon. Um, I think it, something that would also enable us to stop abusing fold expressions uh, is a, a heterogeneous context for for loop. Um, and the the way that that could be used with uh, ID decal is this mocking example where we want to iterate over all the functions. Um, the the another weird part of of kind of what would be cool to see though is having uh, a a this kind of uh, fun, uh, function declaration using uh, the result of fictional ID decal. Uh, it, it probably a compiler writer would look at the number of new constructs on the slide and be like, we have a, a lot of work to do until this is possible. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, probably a lot of people at this conference have already seen already, um, but I think is on the in the future of the language is uh, the idea of implementing virtual traits. Um, and this is a library we wrote uh, called Dino that introduced introduces a new way of dealing with um, runtime polymorphism. So it requires some boilerplate in, e in order to uh, implement an interface, which is uh, kind of delegated to some, uh, to the polymorphic storage. Um, so uh, if, you, if you look on GitHub, you can find uh, an intro example to this library. We're running out of time, I'm not gonna uh, totally explain it, but uh, we can take a little bit of boilerplate out of this by saying, define the interface, then define this concept map template, and in that, uh, we do this ID decal thing uh, where we delegate to the underlying polymorphic storage um, instead of uh, in, the, in the library as it is right now, you have to define drawable essentially twice and define the signature twice. Okay, um, and there, there's other ways, many other ways uh, to use uh, the ability to define a parameterized uh, identifier, uh, member identifier or function identifier at compile time uh, to implement customization points. Uh, go to Mihao Dominiak's talk if you're wondering about how this would work. But be warned that there are macros. <laughs> Don't, don't be afraid of macros, yeah. So uh, as I've said, in, uh, with, th there's a lot of caveats with this design. Uh, this, this is really idealistic design. I, I'm showing the design that I, as uh, uh, a, not, not even a library implementer, a user of the language would like to see um, that would open up metaprogramming a lot to people and enable us to write a lot of useful facilities for reasoning about types and having different relationships between types. But there's a lot of questions. Uh, do we wanna be as flexible as D with hygienic macros where we can insert arbitrary constructs for strings into something and have that be you know, a valid identifier or even just write arbitrary code and have that be compiled into our translation unit? Or do we wanna have a more structured interface with more rules? Do we wanna add more rules to this language that, you know, there's maybe two people in the world who understand all of every rule of C++ in every corner case, right? Um, clearly, we need, there, there's something missing here, and I, I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I'm not an expert, and uh, the, the vision for this going forward, uh, the person who's really championing it has specifically asked us not to uh, talk too much about it, uh, but I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna let this guy continue <laughs> the conversation. Um, but um, unfortunately, you're gonna have to wait a few more months uh, to see what the next installment of this journey is and what the answer to my questions are. Um, I'd also like to thank a, a lot of people who uh, have helped me with putting this presentation together, helping me learn, and also hopefully creating um, a body of work that we can all continue on to have a more powerful and expressive language. And if you want to see all of the code, um, including some code that didn't make it into this presentation, and the source for this presentation, you can go here. Thank you guys.
had like 10 minutes for questions, right? Michael. Yeah, not really a question, but more of a comment. With these uh, types that you're generating, I think what I would like to see is that you can specify the optional target of the, um, the diamond at the bottom, so that they can actually see the types that you're generating. Because if you're doing a lot of filtering and stuff, you're generating new types out of them, I mean, how the hell are you going to know what's in there unless you write code to see what's in there? But if you can reflect, you can reflect on whatever's in there. Yeah, but I need to write code, or you know, have an IDE, right? That is one of the types of. I mean, not to actually use. I mean, every time you build the program, it should be generated, but uh, so that just so that um, not the kind of block out file, but it's an intermediate kind of thing. So, so you want to be able to reflect on the intermediary types generated by the compiler, by Reflexper, or by metaprogramming, I mean, the ones that you're like is template that instantiations. Louis is really like really excited to answer this. I don't know. It's really easy for the compiler to to just give you like a meta polygon debug thing that you throw in your in your truck and it just prints out the the results. And that's one thing that may or may not be in the data, but it stands up for this. It's very easy. Yeah. We could also implement it in the library because basically a fixed thing based on reflector. No, you really like have like an actual just. So there's a couple to summarize. There's things like clang dump ast uh, get debug uh, name of my struct. Uh, there's macros for like dash dash uh, underscore underscore file also for introspection for something. Um, but also one funny trick is sometimes if you have like a very complicated type um, and you're instantiating this type and it's not clear like what the name and all the arguments are, the call site, if you make an intentional typo, sometimes it will like expand it out. I think he'll tell me this. Uh, um, uh, sorry. Questions? Was it, there was some questions over here. No. Yes. I, I, I was just commenting for kind of on the previous thing where like, I think the generated types they should be debuggable. So I think it makes sense what uh, the first person says. Do that. I mean, that's super just write around to a file, and then, then I can get to the file normally, and like it's much more easy to work with. Yeah, I mean that's that's not a language issue, right? That's a tools issue. No, uh, I have to be able to write a file from the language, right? So that I can then step to that file later. So, so it's, it's whatever proposal ends up. Standardized just means to say, by the way, there needs to be a, uh, a, a, a specific default, like third meta debug or whatever, uh, which accepts that kind of expression. And if you're an implementation and you find a string which is meant to be useful, right, you standardize that, and then every compiler is just going to give you the code that is being generated. Uh, okay. I think, I think that's the vision. So instead of static storage, we'll write static printer. Whatever, yeah. I mean, static printer. This is important. <laughs> 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 so just for debugging, so that's, that's, that's I well, just want to say with regard to this, like the standardization community is open to papers for such ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one thing about. I guess this is the equivalent of Patch's book. <laughs> one thing about reflection, actually, that might be relevant here is uh, right now you can only reflect on instantiated templates types. Like, you can't reflect on a template. Um, and it, I think it would be cool to have some interface that's like, uh, walk the la layers of nested templates of a type, or like, and walk across the parameters for for a, like a template definition. Um, some people are making faces that are like, that is sounds right, terrible. Yeah, yes. like, uh, I'll have I'll have to the point where you are manipulating. Okay, <laughs> one can dream. Yeah. <laughs> the templates aren't really a thing; they are a meta thing to generate. <laughs> So have have like but they have to get parsed at some point, right? Rather than that instantiation, you have like a point of parse, and then everything before that you see, and everything after that you don't. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you'd need like a meta reflex for this. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Well, wouldn't that be extra expert? <laughs> yes, David. Reflex, 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 reflex. So, um, like, with regards to like our approach, as we're trying 
wanted to, to take off the really low hanging fruit. This we know we can do, this we know how to do, get that moving through, and then we'll get more usage experience, we'll see how what, what's necessary. Because a lot of things like, oh, it would be cool to reflect on templates, it would be cool to reflect on this, where the question is really, really open, and if we try to put that in a proposal, it might kill the whole thing. So yeah. that's why we have the strategy of putting in the, the low hanging fruit first, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Alistair? So just clarify if I heard correctly, we can reflect on an instantiated template, Correct. but we cannot reflect on an uninstantiated template. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Like a type Any more questions, comments? No? I want this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, who in this room doesn't think reflection is a good idea? <laughs> Why are you in this room? Why are you writing papers about that? Alistair. I'll say when I came into the room, I wasn't sure it was a good idea, and you sold me, so thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. I think that to intersect something is a very good idea, but cogeneration is very great on this. We, we drastically need good generation, cogeneration. Because uh, the idea that it's not a problem of the language, it's a problem of the tools. We need to, uh, to know tools. So the comment is introspection is a good idea, uh, code generation is not a good idea, uh, code generation is a tooling problem, and we would simply, the, it seems like the main argument is compilation times. So, so, so I have like a counter argument, like every tool you have to use is an additional build step, very perfect, and this is a problem that has not yet been solved in a sensible way cross cross platformly like CMake gets close but not all the way there. So it's very hard to integrate some tools and like some people are <coughs> have a stance of I'm not going to use this because it requires me to use the external tool. Luke, uh, Odin, yeah. Yeah um, two comments on that. I think as soon as you're using an external code generator the granularity of your inter interface with that code generator is coarser. Um, and uh, also diffs are terrible, but whatever. Um, the, <laughs> the, the problem of compilation time uh, is not always better programming, but very often better programming. And I think uh, Louis' proposal on better programming will be much faster as well as I understand the compiler, which is not super, but uh, you know, the work that I've done, I've seen uh, compile times go down considerably, like sometimes orders of magnitude versus boost MPL. Um, and the reason it does that is because I'm creating less types that nobody cares about, right? Like a type that's just there to be able to compute the next type. And if you take, and, and the other thing I'm doing with, with uh, um, uh, Fast tracking is basically lowering the amount that I have to string things along because I'm going to work on them later and still need them, right? You know, passing a a a, a uh, parameter from one alias to the next alias to the next alias, and somewhere way down that pole, I'm going to use it, right? Both of those things that I've been trying very hard to reduce and getting better compile times out of it are not a problem at all with uh, Louis, you know, const expert type as a value meta program. You don't have to string things along, and you're not creating any types that you won't end up needing. So I predict, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but it's going to be at least another order of magnitude faster uh, for, for, you know, then my stuff, which is already probably arguably two orders of magnitude faster than what people are typically using, because it's typically boost MPL at this point. So the metaprogramming portion of compile time is going to go away. Um, I just want to point out that I, I don't think it's productive to talk about the increased compilation speeds of a feature which hasn't been designed or implemented at all. Well, <laughs> it doesn't exactly. need any, we it doesn't need any uh, allocation within the compiler to compute most things. And that, I think, 
is uh, you can you can uh, uh, you can predict that that's going to be faster than it. Just, just one quick comment, I guess, on, on the UI search here with the blue card things. Um, one thing that is easy, easily done, well, more easily done if you use code generation inside the compiler, inside the language, is that you can extract you know, information from your program and then do computation on it and then generate a code base on that. If you're using an external tool, the external tool, to do its job properly, it may have to implement essentially a full C++ parser. So it's kind of, it's useful to basically have the, you know, you're already compiling, so now you have the AST representation, so you transform it, and then, well, you do something with it right away. It, I, I mean, it, there, there's some convenience to that, I guess. Yeah, there's another benefit, uh, which is the same decision studio had as a problem in the past. If you have different parsers for a certain language, they are going to be suddenly incompatible with each other. You have a problem in the past if your highlighting would say one thing, intelligence would say a second thing, and the compiler said a third. Well, we free content, so we're not compatible. The problem with having multiple parsers, though, is if we if we had good introspection, I think um, that what I'm trying to say, we can have multiple C++ parsers, um, and and then we can generate introspection code from that, and then that introspection code will differ. That's bad. So let's standardize introspection. I think it sounds like actually we're all agreeing on that. That that's a good thing. But then there's the should we be able to generate C++ code from C++, essentially? So should we be able to, within uh, my compilation unit, after I've reflected on some types with these like meta template uh, utilities, be able to create a new type based on that with new identifiers based on the identifiers of another header? Um, I, <sighs> so I think it's a good thing. I think it it, en it enables people, and I, I think I, I'm just repeating essentially what Louis said, which is that you've already gathered all this AST information um, that in a standard way, um, and you can also uh, probably exploit the fact that you're already compiling this translation, this this program, and you have all this information um, to do that in a quick, in a, more quickly than an external tool would. Um, Jeff, I have another example. Many, many projects reflect C++ in other languages, so inevitably you need to do switch. Yeah, so I was thinking switch, about that today. Please. Yeah. Once and for all. FFI. Yeah. Code, yeah. yeah. So that's generating a C interface, right? Uh huh. Usually, typically, because you know all of the other languages can interface with C. So really, if you think about it, even if I have a, an object-oriented thing, I need to generate like functions, a functional, pure functional yeah. interface. Yes. Um, just another comment on the same topic. Is um, so we already have two ways of generating code. One is macros, the other is templates. Um, and most of the fast programmers hate macros, and most most of the fast programmers hate templates. So if you write a third way of generating code, let's just make sure nobody hates it. Well, like, <laughs> just make sure fewer people hate it than, than the people who hate templates and the people who hate macros. It should just be less hated people. <laughs> Templates are accidental. Right. Well, uh, 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 they, were, they, were, they weren't initially designed to be pure incomplete. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Which is why we have all this mess. They were designed to be C sharp has as a generic. But they accidentally do a bit more. Yeah. A little tiny. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Who here is familiar with list macros? Yeah, so maybe there would be uh, list macros don't operate in terms of uh, text manipulation like C++ or C macros. They work in terms of AST. Yeah. When the list compiles a function, it receives a macro, it executes that function immediately, and it gets an AST, which is the parameter of a reader for the macros, and then it returns a new AST, which is substituted in the macro call. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's an idea to explore for code generation. Uh, th that's definitely an idea. Um, we, this is part of, like, we present three or four different ways of doing code gen in a, in a paper that was on the site before. Uh, one of them is, uh, we say it's a programmatic API to code generation, which is, I think, what, what is the process to what you're saying. One problem I see with that uh, is that list uh, AST is very simple. C++ is AST, it's yeah. not. So if you're going to have to manipulate this AST, you're, I, 
it becomes very complex very quickly. And you have to know about things which you don't care about, such as you know uh, placement, expressions, uh, declarations, and you have to know all these kind of ways to manipulate the CSV properly. That's what I've seen so far. Anyway. So have you used in this macro the template facility? No, I have not used this macro. So in this macro, you could start building the AST by consing and uh, all that crap. Uh, but they have uh, something else, which is uh, they have a way of uh, quoting uh, forms of the scalar so data structure where most of what you're going to write inside it is constant, but for some parts of it, you can insert variables. So it allows you to, to build a very complex AST by simply writing it and uh, incorporating substitu substituted parts. So maybe that could be attractive as well. I, I see very clearly how a macro like uh, Max could be written point. So the point is, um, first of all, it's it's past the allotted time for this session. So if you need to go, then feel free. But I'm going to continue for like five minutes talking. Uh, the idea to have an interface similar to Lisp macros, Louis points out, C++ is way more complicated than Lisp. Um, so uh, having uh, an interface to being able to change the AST would be uh, way harder to implement. Um, I was actually thinking about this because uh, having, if we could generate code at compile time, like uh, one safer way to do that is to have an API that's like similar to Clang AST matchers, if you've ever used that, um, but it essentially enumerates the, the constructs of the language, um, and that would enable you to declare something. And that's what um, some other languages that have reflection have stuff like this, where they, they have like, an interface that, that basically mimics, uh, or it, 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 it's almost like a mirror of the standard, of, of the language design. Um, but it, it is adding more complication. I guess it, it would be adding some library complication. Maybe we could have a language level mechanism uh, for, for, the, uh, for this, and then the API would wrap it in a kind of like type safe way. Um, and that would be more hygienic than having macros. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>